All right, so here we have function f of x is equal to 2x plus 1 to the third. And we're going to have g be the inverse function of f. And we have that f of 0 is 1. What's the value of g of 1, or g prime of 1? OK, so um, let's um, first rewrite um, the f of x and g of x in terms of each other so we know like what an inverse you know, function really does. So if f of x and g of x are inverse functions, that means if you take f of g of x, you're going to get x. That's the idea. It undoes the other function's operation. You get to just get x. And same thing, if you take g of f of x, you'll also just get x. Now, um, since we're trying to find g prime of 1, we want an expression for g prime first. Once we have, again, an expression for g prime, then we just plug in 1 and evaluate it. So if we were to take the derivative of this, we would need chain rule, so we have f prime of g of x times g prime of x, which will be equal to the derivative of x, which is just 1. And so now let's just solve this for g prime of x. And now just give us that g prime of x will be equal to 1 over f prime of g of x. And then from here, we want to find g prime of 1. So g prime of 1 will simply be 1 over f prime of g of 1. So what's g of 1? Well, if f of 0 is 1, that means g of 1 will be 0. Because remember, they undo each other. So then this will be the same as 1 over f prime of 0. Remember, f of 0 gives you 1, that means f of g of 1 will give you 0. So we really just need to find out f prime of 0. So let's just find f prime and evaluate it for when x is 0. So let's take the derivative of this, f prime of x, using the chain rule and power rule, will be 3 times 2x plus 1 to the second power times the derivative, the derivative of the inside, which will just be 2. So let's see this be 6 times 2x plus 1 to the second power. So f prime of 1, or f, so f prime of 0, will be 6 times 2, 0 plus 1 squared. So this would be 6 times 1 squared, 6 times 1. So that would just be 6. And so this will just be 1 over 6. And so then our answer would just be b. All right, 21. The line y equals 5 is a horizontal aspect of the graph of which the following functions. Okay, so um, remember, let's figure out what, like, what, what this horizontal function means. How much of my tensor? Anyways, no, horizontal, not horizontal function, horizontal asymptote. Remember, it's a horizontal line function approaches when, it, when x is very, very large or very, very small. So it's going to approach the line y equals 5. doesn't mean it has to always stay below or always stay above. It just it can do some sort of like oscillation. But it has to basically get infinitely close to 5 as x goes towards infinity or negative infinity. So essentially, we just want to see um, when x is super, super large or super, super small, which of these equals 5. So a couple ways to do this. You can kind of just use the... Um, power rule or um not power rule but like there's there's this um coefficient rule you can use um so <clears throat> excuse me i can kind of see it right away but um when you have a rational function which we have here if you take if you if you take the coefficients of the rational function with the same powers um what would happen essentially now Again, you could put big numbers into it, the sine of infinity over infinity, what would happen there? Or you can use basically L'Hopital's rule. Sometimes you may, may not learn L'Hopital's rule um, until, you know, maybe Calc 2. But um, what that means is you just take the derivative of the top and bottom functions until something happens. But beware of that you, if you only can use L'Hopital's rule if you have, um, 
a function over a function where if you plug in number, you get like an indiscriminate form or uh, undefined form. Anyways, um, just looking at this, this is something you can probably remember from pre-cal, putting this in order, 20 x squared minus x over four x squared plus one. You can divide each of these terms by x squared. So you get 20 x squared over x plus minus x over x squared over x squared, four x squared over x squared, plus one over x squared. And what happens, these x squares cancel. So you get y is 20 minus one over x, all over four plus one over x squared. Now what you do is you take the limit as x gets very, very large, very, very small. If you say the limit of x gets towards infinity of this, and what you'll get is 20 minus, because one over a super, super large number just goes to zero. This is becomes zero. And one plus a very, very big number squared is zero. So what you get is 20 minus zero over four plus zero. If you just get 20 over four, which will be five. And so your answer will be E. Twenty-two. I say hydrate, you know. Right, twenty-two. Let f be the function defined by f of x is the natural log of x over x. What's the absolute maximum of f? Okay, so this is where we want to take the derivatives um, and find the critical values, and then study what's going around what's going on around that critical value. So, using the quotient rule, f prime of x will be equal to this is square the denominator function. And this will be on top, we'll have the, the, the derivative of the top function, which will be one over x times the bottom function, x minus top function times the derivative of the bottom function, which is times one. And this will just be one minus the natural log of x all over x squared. Now we want to find where this is zero or where it's undefined. So when is zero equal to this? So we just want to solve when is one minus the natural log of x equal to zero. And that just means when is the natural log of x equal to one? Well, e to the zero, or sorry, e to the one, when e to zero is going to be one. Because remember the natural log is Natural log of function would, would get to raise um, e to to get one. So then x will just be e. Or I said that wrong, sorry. E, remember, e to the one equals x. I kind of worded that wrong. So um, our critical value would be e. So we want to break up our interval at e and see what's going on before and after that. But let's remember that the function f of x is undefined for x equals zero. And it's gonna be undefined for values less than zero. You can't take the natural log of any number that's negative. So you're essentially just looking for zero, not, nothing to the left of zero. We're gonna look at from zero to e and from e upwards. So just pick any number in here. We're gonna pick like, you can pick, you know, f, F prime of one, see what's going on there. And we can pick like F prime of like 10, see what's going on here. We only really care about the sign. So F prime of one, we plug, we, we plug one into here. We get one minus the natural log of one over one. The natural log of one is just zero. So we just get one or we get one, so we just get we get a one our positive number. We get a positive number, so we know the function is increasing. I'm going to see what f prime of ten will be. One minus the natural log of ten over a hundred over ten squared over a hundred. The natural log of ten we know is going to be more than one. So we again we declare that then that means the top number will be negative. 
So this will be less than zero. So we have a negative number here. That means the graph is well, that means the graph is of f of x is decreasing. So since it's increasing before e and decreasing after e, the, the max is going to occur at e. That'll be the highest point in the function. I don't know what's going up in that pencil. I think she's right better than this. So um, it occurs at e. Well, let's evaluate the function at e. Let's not make the sum make that silly mistake. So I'm going to do my work down here. All right, I can do it up here. So f of e will be natural log of e over e. The natural log of e is just one. So our answer is just one over e. This is our answer is just b. Is top of my genes? I'm not to use my pen. All right, 23. If t of t is the size of the population at time t, which of the following differential equations describes linear growth and the size of the population? Well, when we're talking about um, a differential equation, when we have, you know, uh, a linear growth, remember going back to just like algebra, we have y equals mx plus b. The trick here is to recognize that, you know, in a linear equation, the rate of growth is constant n. However, it's not just going to be a constant. It wouldn't be a, because we're saying that the, the differential equation describes linear growth. The linear growth it's, itself, or I mean, the differential equation itself is a different, the, the, the differential equation itself is a linear equation. So it's going to be some form of a constant times a variable. So here we have B as our answer because we have based the linear equation. And this linear equation describes linear growth of the differential equation. Your answer will be B. Um, you don't really go that deep into differential equations and calculus one. Um, you really honestly probably go more deep in like calc. Well, in a separate course that runs parallel, something in calc two. Um, you kind of learn a little more about it, but um, it's really something that you'll learn. You'll go into when you um do um like a hard science. Um, it's kind of like a, it's a, it can be very confusing, but it's kind of good. It's very it's good for you guys to see it early here, but um don't let it overwhelm you so much because they can be confusing at first. 